Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why It Matters. My name is Tracy Kronzak. I'm Director of Innovation here at Now It Matters, joined always by my co our co-founder in this endeavor, Tim. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Um, today's guest is someone I think Tim and I can both say a lot about from many different angles. I'm super excited to have her on. I'll just only add my personal... A uh, plug, and that is I first met Rakia back through when I was a Salesforce MVP and in those circles. And we bonded, I feel like, over the idea that we need to talk about power and privilege and systemic structures a lot more in tech than we do right now. Uh, and as I just said right before we hit record, I could gush about that for about another hour. Uh, but Tim, I don't know if you want to add color on that before we throw it over to Rakia to introduce herself. Yeah, Rakia and I have known each other for several years um, and always mean to sit down, grab coffee, talk, and uh, for years now have been trying to do that. So this is the first long conversation that we've been able to have. I'm so looking forward to it. So welcome to the show, um, Rakia, and would you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you both for having me. I am Rakia Finley. I am the founder and managing partner of Copper and Vine Studio. We are a product development innovation firm based out in Washington, D.C. I'm also an entrepreneur. Um, I do a number of investment ventures, and I mentor and travel the world talking about the power of emotional intelligence amongst some of the most excellent leaders in the world. So I'm really happy to be here. That's amazing, and your LinkedIn profile shows that same that same kind of uh, journey for you. So I noticed that you have over 13 experiences, and five of them say founder or co-founder. So this is a thing for you. Founding is like something that you do, um, and and I I love following you because you go places. Um, can you tell us how you how you started in in that work? Yes, I love problems. I think problems are the most interesting thing that the universe will give you. Every single morning, you have an opportunity to solve a problem. And solving that problem means that you might help someone's day be a little bit better. You might help something go a little faster or a little easier. Um, I love that idea. So what you see through my experience of business is really me finding a problem that if I didn't solve it, I just would have been so disappointed. I also am interested and very passionate about what effective business looks like. Um, when I went to business school, I learned all these fantastic principles about what it meant to run a company. And what I saw missing in it was empathy. What I saw missing in it was structure that allowed for ease and joy. Um, and I love the idea of starting companies around problems in which you know that you are going to make someone's day just a little bit brighter. And under that hood, you also create jobs and um, beautiful life structures for people that allows them to wake up a bit happier. So there's this continuous win-win exchange. I also am an inventor, a database developer, a coder, and an engineer by trade, and those are things that I am deeply passionate about. Um, and I'm honored to be a Black woman in those spaces with those skills to be an example of what it looks like to create. Um, so a lot of those other companies you see are really me getting to show off the things that I'm good at. I, I'm... I'm almost distracted by how positive you are. Yeah. Do, you, do people say that a lot? Like there's a lot of pain and suffering in this world. And it, it and it's like someone cranked up the dial on that. And I consider myself an optimist. I even have like creating hope as part of the lofty ideals of now it matters. I, I'm not getting where you're getting. Like I'll just, like I, I, I can't get there. What, um, you know, what, what, does that what how do you how do you be that way yeah my friends would uh, agree with you they, my optimism sometimes is not always welcomed 
You know, I, my experience as a very young um, child in this world was one of low economic understanding. I come from a very impoverished area in Portland, Oregon. Majority of my childhood experiences were those around criminal um, endeavors. And I was met with my losing my life at five years old and with a gun in my face um, with a, a person's full intention of killing me to make a point to my father. And it was in that moment where I begged for not only my life, but the life of my brother and my mother. And we were able to walk away from that day. And from that day, we went through a journey of deep poverty to get away from what was not a healthy um, environment. And when I got into grade school and got a bit older and learned about these passions and skills that I had, it simply was an opportunity to get me and the family that I cared for out of those experiences and out of those impoverished experiences. And I never really saw it beyond that. And then um, the, the joy of activating and moving into your purpose in life is all of a sudden you look up and you have these really beautiful ways in which you get to pour into the world. I wake up every day with the understanding that I was not supposed to be here but it has been very intentioned that I am. So every day is a good day. Every day is a day that I get to choose life. Every day is a day that I get to hold whether or not I live or die. And it makes being positive really easy because if there is something in this world that is causing me not to be optimistic, well, what is that, Tim? That's a problem. So that means that there's something we have to solve. So to Rakia. sum up, you're positive because when you were five, someone held a gun to your head. Like, I, that is like, I'm sorry, but that just ratchets up like, oh, okay, well, uh, yeah, then of course. I mean, that that's an obvious connection there. So um, I just think that's, that's such an incredible paradigm to view your history through. Um, and, Thank you for you know, sharing that, yeah, by exactly. the way, really. I, I it's super vulnerable when folks talk very openly about what shapes them. Um, and I just want to say thank you for that, because I feel like even in my own life experiences, I heard myself in that. Um, Tim and I recorded our Why It Matters back oh, a few months ago. And for both of us, the topic of those days where we thought of literally ending our lives came up. Um, and, and growing up the way I did and coming up through the things that I came through, particularly as a queer person and a super duper like gender variant person, you know, I gave myself an expiration date at 25 years old. I was like, I'll be dead by 25 and I'm going to live my whole life that way. And it didn't happen. And that was actually a crisis that forced me to ask some of those same questions. So thank you for bringing that up. Um. And I think optimism is, is more fun that way. Either way, you're going to have an issue. Either way, the day is going to do what the day does. Either way, adults be adulting, right? Like either way, it's going to happen. So why choose to lean into the bad of it? it? You're going to get out of it. If you didn't believe you were going to get out of it, you wouldn't be complaining about it. You wouldn't be talking about it. You wouldn't give it energy. If you really truly accepted defeat of anything, of any situation. So if you haven't accepted defeat because you've given it energy, then it's up to you how you choose to move through it. And you can choose to move through it sad. And sad is okay. And I, I, I'm an active crier. So sad is okay. But choosing to not see the light in a dark situation is choosing just to hide under the covers. Hmm. So find the light and fight like hell to find the light. Ricky, I've met a lot of people that are comfortable in their own skin. I think you're one of the first people I've met that's comfortable in their own soul. And I think that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way that you're getting at that that, that, goes, that goes beyond both mental and, and emotional acuity, which I, I mean, you're loaded with both. So like that helps, I'm sure. But, um, but there's, there's, um, there's just something I feel in your soul. And, and every time I'm around you, I feel it. So this is not an isolated experience. I just recognize it more, getting more context for it. So 
I just want to thank you for that and and saying that um, there there are a few people in life who, when you're around them, you know yourself better because of that. And I feel like um, even in this conversation, as brief as it's been so far, that's already true. And I'm really grateful for that. And I know that I know um, and suspected, but then confirmed um, that faith faith is an underlying piece of what happens for you in that. Um, and and so I. Both Tracy and I have talked about this, uh, you know, that we have very, very different faiths uh, from each <laughs> other, but that faith is actually really important in what we do. Uh, I think I'd, I'd like to know what role faith has played in helping you be who you are. Oh, yeah. The universe is so important. <laughs> um, you know, in this world of technology, being in the technology industry, it really can, if you allow it, allow you to kind of believe that you can will it all, or, you know, just with a couple lines of code, you can make the world change. And it almost can easily kind of create this power complex around, especially if you create things for other people for a living. So for me, my faith journey and my spiritual journey is that one of one self-guidance, self-boundary of me always being able to say, am I being the most morally based person? Am I being the most empathetic person? Um, my spiritual journey is really mine and my alone. And I think that is something I've learned is a lot different than others from time to time is, is that spiritual journey you asking so many people to the party or is it actually a journey of, of true self, of you understanding why with all this dust and particle, with all of who I am, why was I, why am I here? I'd like to believe that um, I'm not here just for me. I don't think that anyone on this earth is, is simply just meant for them to exist and take up space. And I struggled with that at a young age because I was in tech. So I was just like, well, I'm not meant to be anybody. I'm just supposed to code some things and build some websites and call it a day. And I really had to go deep within myself to say, what is my purpose here? Why would you give me these, these such binary skills and such passionate ways of being? Um, they didn't feel like they went together. And the spiritual journey was me really getting deep understanding around all of me of why all of me was poured into. And then from that journey, got really learned and got excited about the more that I pour into myself, the more that I learn about myself, the more that I get in connection with what it, I believe I'm meant to pour into this world, the more I'm able to do it, the better I'm at, I'm at it, right? The, the more I believe that every idea that I have is meant to be a blessing to somebody somehow in some way, it makes those ideas a little bit easier, right? When I choose to believe that every conversation and I have very difficult business discussions, I, I still am a business owner that does acquisition deals and investment deals. I have the same hard conversations as every CEO you've ever spoken to. But I believe that in every conversation, there is a win-win approach to it because I believe that in my spiritual journey, I am not placed on this earth to cause pain, difficulty, complexity, or stress. Right? So if I'm telling you something that is stressing you out, we get to get honest about it. So my spiritual journey is one of being able to be uh, a calm and hearing and, and powerful leader. It also is one of me being able to gut check why it is I have the privilege I have because it's meant to be a blessing to others. It also is meant to be a guide for me to understand the silence necessary for me to hear beyond myself, beyond what's in front of me. It is a, a real indicator of where my scarcity exists. And I think a lot when we think about where we can do, what we can do in our society is remove as much scarcity. We have too much scarcity mindset in our, our world. So it also is this belief, is this, this immediate activation of abundance. Um, I think with all those things, it just makes things go a little bit more smoother. I love everything you said. It's funny. Yeah, it's uh, Tim alluded to this. We come from two very different faith traditions. Uh, uh, 
you know, mine, as I think I've shared with you before, like I'm actually an ordained goddess priestess in the temple of Isis. And one of the things that's funny is when you take on that kind of faith journey, there is this sort of like, if you almost think of that, the way that I've described it is there's this third rail on the subway train, right? That's like 700 volts. And you get that kind of energy imbued in you. And your first inclination is to act and to react and to do and to do everything. And when I have had the privilege of training now initiates in our sort of temple, I say, that's actually the last thing that you need to do. The first thing you need to do is figure out how that is forcing you to listen and observe to what's around you. Uh, and that is then from which momentum is built, not immediate action. Uh, and yet at the same time, something I wanna dig into with you is you have started a retreat series called By Grace. I have been a fan and follower of this uh, for a long time since they started. And someday I will show up on those shores. But tell us a little bit about- Do you feel about... so intimidated about implying to that, by the way, Tracy? Like, what do you I mean? must have started that application six times. And I'm like, oh man, like- yeah, no, like, I, I'm just saying like, isn't completing it. It would be showing up. So I'm curious if you have the same. Oh, same no. Kind of well, even worse, like even worse, like to the exact premise of why by grace exists. I'm like, I'm too tired to do this right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, there's a thousand other things that are calling for my priority. I will put this back and can come back to it when I am not so tired. Um, and I think that is the trap we get in as change makers and faith workers and believers in things bigger than us. And I'd, I'd love to hear more about that in your words. Absolutely. Um, I can't wait for both of you to attend, by the way. And Tim, you're absolutely right. Once you apply, it is you coming. Like that is your commitment. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. I love that. Um, <laughs> by Grace began five years ago. And um, our very first by Grace was in Barcelona. So first by Grace is a restoration and executive leadership retreat made for change makers, leaders and founders all over the globe. And we don't go to the same place twice. And we call every um, by Grace retreat, the participants that attend, we call them cohorts because they then work together and separately over a course of seven days to identify true restoration, true rest, and true retreat. Um, and there's some philosophies around that that come out of it. The very first why, why did we start by grace, um, began at the time I had Copper and Vine and, and the work that I do is I am honored to work with a number of amazing founders and entrepreneurs bringing their products and companies into the market. And those people still stay on either as clients or friends. And over that year, I had ushered over close to, I think we were at $150 million in acquisitions over the course of that year. And it was a great year. A lot of these were startups and small ideas. Um, and within those clients, three of them committed suicide after that wow. acquisition. And Wow. In this discussion and, and having social friends in that same tax bracket also not doing okay. And this was before the pandemic. And it really became an empathetic, empathetic call to action of saying, what is wrong? Right? What, what aren't we saying out loud? All these people have therapists, they have assistants, they have staff, they have everything that we say that you need to not have these things. And Barcelona was us inviting some of those identified leaders to Barcelona and saying, leave your phone right here. Just leave your phone right here and walk with us. And let's have a discussion about who it is you are and if you're okay. And what we identified in that first couple of hours is nobody was okay. And there were these very successful and powerful, and this was our all, we, this, this one particularly was all men. 
and um, the amount of discussions we had around what was being lost. And in the midst of having those, what is lost, what is missing from my reality, we started activating them while we were in Barcelona. So I miss, I don't have art in my life. Great, let's go on a walking tour and experience art. Let's go paint on the beach. Let's, let's activate it back into your life. That continues and we went from Barcelona to Los Angeles where we worked with a number of um, entertainers and Hollywood um, influencers um, and saw the same need, saw the same I'm not okay and activated those same seven days. And then we went to Turks and, nope, then we went to Cayman Islands and we saw the same thing, all these pioneering international leaders and change makers that were not okay. Um, and then we went to Turks and Caicos and had that same experience. Now we get to go to Anguilla. What we identify in that first day of not okay is simply just a gut check and an acknowledgement of what in your life are you retreating from? What have you vacated from? And what is it that you are truly meant to do in this world? So now we have the understanding, now let's bridge the gap in these seven days. And how do we do that? What we identify is there's tons of retreats out there for executive leaders all over the world. Majority of them require you to go into a forest and eat mushrooms off the ground and um, <laughs> only consume water and question your life, right? And what we've told ourselves is this is an experience that most CEOs need because they need to learn humility. When yeah. we start talking about our entrepreneurs and our leaders of color, when we start talking about our leaders of different experiences, when we stop talking about our cisgen leaders and actually start looking at our colorful demographic of influencers, they don't need to eat mushrooms off the ground. What they have yet to experience is a high life of abundance without restriction. What they have never been able to ideate of is themselves in full bloom without any sense of ceiling or glass or cisgendered or white angloed peeping down on them. So how on earth would we ask this generation's Aristotles? How on earth would we ask this generation's Einsteins, this generation's Mahatma Gandhi's, this generation's, how dare we ask them to see change in this world when they can't even see themselves? Pass your salary requirement, pass your demographic count. So for seven days, we bring these beautiful spirits to a place and we allow them to experience abundance and see themselves in it. And then we ask them a question of who are they when they have everything they need, when this society and this world is bending at their foot because we know in them we need change. And we ask them to think of those things and write them down. And hopefully if we do our job right, they'll go back home and they won't be retreating. They will be requiring of their lives to be better. So. We hope you can. I literally had to stop myself from tearing up. Um, it reminds me a few months back, uh, Tim and my wife, Amy, actually gave me a beautiful intervention. Uh, one of the parts to my story is I had a really rough ending to 2019 in a way that honestly should be in the courts uh, with a former employer and I'm just like out of energy or care to keep pursuing it. You know, I've had a lawyer tell me it's not like there aren't multiple tort violations here. It's just that the path to solving this is about five years. And I don't have the time for that shit anymore. I really don't. But it produced an effect in me that has resonated through my work. And finally, Tim and my wife sat me down and they were like, shut up and stop thinking of yourself as a has been. Like you are actually at the start of something and not at the end of something. So shut up with that bullshit. And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> and, but, you know, to the point around learning and growing, um, what I love about everything that you said is that it, how very broadly inclusive it is uh, and, and how inclusive the journey of faith is. Uh, because honestly, I see it too. I see it in executives that I work with now. I see it in 
I have some lingering ties to Hollywood and the Democratic Party, and I see it in those leaders. Everybody's running short on faith and belief in themselves because the hurdles that we all perceive and are so good at articulating feel so much more insurmountable every day that we're like, I'll take care of this stuff later. Uh, and thank you for bringing the stuff that we all say, I'll take care of later, back into the limelight. Because I think for all of us, that's what started us on those journeys in the first place. And, and that's a beautiful reminder of that. So thank you for that. No it's been an honor. I mean, the honesty is we're asking, I mean, you guys do it so well. We're asking for a society that doesn't have systematic oppression. We're asking for a society that allows equal equity all across the gamut. To do that, we need to know that the people in which we are setting intentions for change for are prepared to walk in them. And the analogy I gave one time, it was someone with a wait, right, hoping to write a big check to somebody to solve all the world of, of racism. <laughs> just thought a check would solve it. And I, money is helpful. I'll just say that. It but is yes. helpful. <laughs> so we began. This I see where you're going. <laughs> what can we do? What can we do? And I said, you know, this is a fantastic offering. But what you now are asking is to build a fantastic mansion and yep. to ask someone from the hood to live in it. Yep. And it's unfair for an assumption to think that there is this, this grand fix that does not require a restoration of a society and a generation to fix it. I, you know, I build technology for a living. I know that no matter what you build, the most important conversation is the adoption strategy. Yes. And if we apply the adoption strategy to systematic oppression, we'd get a lot more honest about where we are in the project process of this journey of equality. And what By Grace shows us is in this project process of adoption, right now, I'd like, I'm going to liken this to a good website, you know, ref, ref, refurb. And right now what we have are CEOs that are depleted. We have CEOs and founders that are agitated, that have low tolerance, that are tired of talking about DEI or tired of talking about change, tired of spending money on it. And what we're not understanding is they require a different adoption strategy. We're asking them to sign on to a different portal. We're asking them to, to enter their data in differently and to see it output differently. We're asking them to omit the bad data. We're actually telling them that their data was bad, right? The data they've been processing and working on for so many years. So if we look at where we are, we need by grace because we need restoration and we need refurbs of our existing websites. <laughs> but we I was hoping also... you would get there because you were pointing to healing and reconciliation as the journey. Exactly. Yeah. So we get to allow you to still be, but we need to put a new process, right? A new uh, coding structure under you. And in that process, you might get to look a little cuter. And with that, we also get to create an adoption of our new users. This is their first time signing on to this platform. This is their first time downloading this software of freedom and equality and equity and try without dying. And that's a platform they've never seen work. They ain't mm -hmm. never signed on. It ain't never been available. The site always been down. So yeah, that's been error we, 404 for 400 years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking that. <laughs> so we have two, we have two projects in alignment from my perspective. And I'd like to believe that's what Copper and Vine and, and by Grace do as a collective unit within this project. So interesting that you're talking about, um, about that because, um, a couple of years ago, I got so fed up with not knowing if the work we had done for nonprofits and implementing at that time Salesforce, but whatever system, several years later, had it actually accomplished what it was supposed to do. 
And I, I had, I could not honestly say whether it had or not. And when we're looking at sometimes the largest or second largest capital investment that a nonprofit has made, and I'm taking that money and I can't be sure that that actually had the intended objectives met at the end of it. I, I, I just said, I can't play that game anymore, not in good conscience. And so we re-scripted how we engage um, and, and ended up, you know, coming up with a methodology around digital transformation. But the aha moment for me was that we kept compartmentalizing change into a project instead of understanding that the organization itself and the humans in that organization were actually the most important thing to change, you know? And so we developed, you know, a, a, there's this, the tech stack that's very carefully architected. And then the human stack is just almost like, you know, at the end of the project, here you go and, you know, um, ho hope it works and realize exactly what you're talking about. You know, it's not just an adoption strategy, it's actually a shift in culture. And interestingly enough, that led us to a theory of change that indexes staff, directors, and executives. They need, you know, staff need data, um, information is, is what's needed by directors and executives need insight. And so just framing it out as there are different personas at work here and you have to actually think about each one individually and stop compartmentalizing and focusing on the project and instead say like the outcome here is a new organization. And, and I, just, I think that has so much application to what you're talking about with DEI um, because there's never been more funding and more frustration around it, right? And and it, it it's it's um, so I, I think that that's just interesting. Um, I think that is I think that's as much as I can say as a white guy because I feel like then I run out of runway on this, and and it's not my experience in the same way. Um, but it is something I care about deeply. I read a lot about and, um, and 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 do whatever work I can do, which feels pretty minimal. Um, and I think that that's, I think it's just so refreshing to hear your perspective on that. Um, the other thing I think it would be easy to not, to not know, and I only happen to know this um, because I was, when I met you or shortly after the next Dreamforce maybe, we were, we were hanging out and you told me about um, how lonely it is as a, uh, as a black woman who is a founder to get invited to these you know these VIP parties of executives at at you know at Dreamforce, and and to show up and be asked for ID and assumed that you're not part of that conversation, and when you're in there, being asked for more food because you're assumed to be the caterer. And I I feel like I don't like what I can't reconcile is your your peace and calmness with that as a backdrop because that was not. I did not get the sense that was an isolated incident. Um, can you can you speak to that? Is that like how do you how do you reconcile the peace and confidence that you exude with the with the anger and justifiable anger and frustration that you experience? Loaded questions, Tim. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, it has not been an isolated incident. I you know I I was my my, my boss, I guess, at 19 years old, I've never worked for anyone, really, uh, other than my clients, who I love, um, my, most of my adult life. And um, I've, you know, had some of my most prominent accolades in my life before I hit 22. So I built, you know, the Starwood Hotels. I was 21 years old when we launched that. Um, Uma, the first artificial intelligence that spoke diverse namings, that was before I was 25. So I internally always existed in a very executive space. It was not until I got a team and a bigger team that required me to be that executive and start going into these events and these spaces. And then you get a marketing team and your marketing team is telling you to go into these events and spaces. And here I am in these events and spaces. Um, and a bit from a naive space, I, I was blessed to go to a HBCU where I was surrounded by Black excellence. My mentors were Black excellent um, um, leaders. I'm, I have a community. I will say my number one tip for anyone that experiences what I experience is have a community 
that you can go to and talk to and talk it out with. Tracy and I bonded over those frustrations and those realities. Um, and you do need that. You simply just, there's a realist component to it of saying there is still work for us to do. And I am still a victim and, and, and part of the work for me to see the, the work that we're doing, right? I'm still a victim to the systematic oppression that we are trying to change. It keeps me awake, right? So what I learned through walking in those spaces and having those moments, I think in the beginning of my career, anger, that's all I ever felt. Uh, yes. I think I showed it, you know, I think you, you get to a point in your life where you know how to make your anger look cute and you know how to chuckle it off or find your friends or find your comfort. I think my number one trick was I knew why I was there. I never let anyone tell, tell me why I was in a room. I always knew why I was in a room. So no matter what took place, I could, whether I needed to find a bathroom, whether I needed to find a corner, you know, whether I needed to take a shot, whatever I needed to do, I would reset and remind myself why I was in a room. Um, and eventually what my anger turned into, as I think I matured in my career, was asking more questions. Well, why, why do you think I'm the waiter? Why do you need my ID and you did not need his? I, I'm, I'm inquiring because I don't understand the difference. That allowed me to just get more educated. And I think there is power in being deeply aware in other people's ignorance. And instead of assuming their ignorance, because my assumptions to ignorance were always dangerous. My assumption yeah. to why this cisgendered white man asked me if I assumed that I worked here is far more dangerous than the answer of his ignorance if I were to inquire. And when I learned that it was, my mother identifies it as she says, I have an issue with, I, I'm addicted to looking the, the, going to the belly of the beast. My mom's like, you're gonna get swallowed. You love going to the belly of the beast. And for me, it was that it was, I, so now I'm, I'm kind of in a space where I inquire, I'm interested. Why on earth would you think someone like me that looks like me would, would needs to hold your jacket, right? And, and we get to have an honest discussion about it. The honesty of what's happening in this world when it comes to race and oppression and unconscious bias, and I've been speaking on unconscious bias for over 10 years of my career, it is still deeply unconscious. It is still not being called out in a way that is going to hurt a bit, right? We're still giving participation trophies to oppression. It is still lonely, right? I am still the only black woman in that space, in that room. I might have a couple of friends with me, right? But I'm, I'm still one of a particular circumstance as a CEO and a business owner that can walk in and say particular things. I can say whatever I want to on this podcast, right? There's no one's going to jeopardize my check. I can talk any way that I want to talk. I can live whatever life I want to live. That is not a reality for predominantly majority, predominant majority of Black people in this world. Do not have 75% of the social privilege. I'm not even talking about financial, the social privilege that I have in my reality. And I still might get a coat handed to me. And it's easy to think that I can do something about it. It's easy to think that a check can do something about it. This is a societal, generational, you know, concern and issue that has plagued our society for generations. It cannot be fixed by one voice. And what I get opti why I get so optimistic about it is because I know the pro the pro the the solution to my problem. I know that the, when I walk into that executive space post COVID and I see a multitudes of me, I don't have to worry. I could get obsessed with the problem, right? I can get obsessed with the selfish problem around it of me being lonely in that space, or I can get really honest about the solution. The next time I walk in here, I need to make sure that there is more of me than them. So now let me go back and do what I need to do. I don't have to sit in this, this gate, this reception hall to figure that out. I don't have to remember his name. I don't have to ask for his permission. I don't have to ask for his acceptance. I just need to know I need to go back and the next time I see him, he needs to be the only one here. 
And I get to make that choice. I get to create that change, that influence. So maybe I still do get a little bit angry, but I think I just put it somewhere else maybe. Yeah, it, uh, wow. I appreciate your comments on that, yeah. I think yeah. what's interesting in everything that you said, I mean, you're also, uh, first of all, like I hear echoes of Malcolm X a little bit in 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 what you're saying, and I love that. Um, I also, you know, love that what you are talking about in some ways is restorative justice and, you know, how that shapes the world that we live in. Uh, and, and I thought immediately of like Van Jones's work with the Redemption Project. And I was like, okay, like, and I think one of the things that's true, I mean, even for me, like, <laughs> Thank you for showing me the path beyond anger because I'm still more, I'm like 60% anger, 40% something else. Uh, and, and somehow that manifests itself in those rooms where I'll occasionally find like the white boy in this sort of penguin suit whom I know is an exec and be like, I'm sorry, can I get more food? Um, just to be kind of, you know, turn the script on that a little bit. Um, do you know where I can get a Coke? Uh, <laughs> because... I can be that way and that's okay. But, you know, one of the other things I want to ask you about is, is we, we, we had a plan for this discussion and now we are in such a deep, amazing philosophical territory. I don't want to leave it, but you're talking about wide scale culture change. You're talking about wide scale perception change. You're talking about undoing the things that allow all of us to participate better and with more of ourselves, but not in that disingenuous way of, I added 50 black people and 50 Latinos and 50 queer folks to my company and yay, my job is done. You know, you're talking about fundamental shifts. My theory on this has always been that until the very top layers vacate, even the best of those endeavors are not going to be able to retain those folks. And I'm wondering if you see a different path forward because power never gives itself up, period. You know, power never concedes. Yeah. You know, I've grown. I, I blame this on my motherhood. Um, I've, I've grown to become a team player. Mm. And I think prior, a more ruthless version of me, a more uh, <laughs> in my more simplistic feminist thought, I think I had a different answer. In this new generational answer, I look at my son a lot and I, I get very honest of anything that I pour into this world at this point, you truly, you and your generation get to benefit more if I do this correctly. So I look at him a lot and I say, okay, what does he need? Unfortunately, that requires us to be team players, I believe. And when we look at these top level executives and um, where they are now, I am, because of the position that I'm in, and I thank, my, I thank my career for allowing me to be in particular rooms, to know, to have a different perspective around our executives. It's been a long time since some of our top, like, top executives have been have really received pressure, social pressure, self-pressure. Uh, they've received financial pressure. They've received pressure that they had to then push onto their team. But we still are in a place where we aren't applying enough pressure on the founders and true leaders and check writers. That's how I like to reference them, the true check mm -hmm. writers of this industry. And uh, we kind of take the second tier as as penance and acceptance i that's do right. not believe that's going to get us anywhere i don't believe tearing down all the statues of existence cisgendered you know male white angloed is is going to solve the problem kind of to my perspective earlier i do believe that there is something that they get to experience that many of us experience every day and that is a deep fight to stick around, a deep fight to continue to grow, a deep fight to keep your job. And I'd like to see executive, I'd like to see more diverse board team, board uh, members. I'd like to see 
more diverse investors. I'd like to see more and you know diverse people that surround those people happen and then to apply pressure. Um, but I don't think telling CEO so-and-so to go and never come back to work again and, and go to his vacation home is now the sudden going to make equality happen in that corporation yeah. that is ill advised. Yeah. So I, I think we have to invite them to the hard party um, and not just the let us tell you what we're doing party, which is sometimes I think we fall victim to sometimes. I agree with you 100%. Um, also, Cheryl Conti, who wrote a whole book called The Mechanical Bull uh, about this and, and was one of our past guests here also talks about this from a very sort of facts and statistics basis. And I don't know if we always do that in the way that she outlined. And she's like, it is a fact that more diverse boards create better businesses. And she was able to literally pull facts and statistics out and say, here's how this works and here's why it works. And that, that goes hand in glove with everything you just said about that exerting that pressure in new ways. So thank you. Uh, to that point, I know that you started um, in Copper and Vine, you started a fund that is specifically aligned um, to creating that next generation. I'd love for you to talk about the Rico Grant and what you see happening with that. Yeah, the RICO grant is really special to my heart. It's something we started um, pretty much right when the pandemic began two, two marches ago. And it really came from the journey of the Black Lives Matter movement, easily seeing a problem that needed to be solved and asking uh, Copper and Vine and our entire team of saying, what problem do we get to solve in this? And we did two things. We one built a mobile application called Step Forward, which is an app in the app store that's available all throughout the world that allows people to take one step at a time towards advancing the conversation and actions towards equality. Um, it's a five-star rated app and it was built by our entire team. Second to that, we then launched the RICO Grant Project, which is an internal um, grant funded project by Copper and Vine that is taking Black founders, for profit or nonprofit, and producing either $50,000 if they're for profit or $75,000 if they're for or nonprofit. Did I say that right? $50,000 as a for profit, $75,000 as a nonprofit um, towards building their platform. So, towards building their proprietary. Tory, um, dedicated platform a solution that they would place into the industry or market um, to solve a problem for their customers or constituents. That has, um, it was supposed to be a year. It was a call to action around all the agencies and digital solution service providers in the US that were at the time stating that they deeply cared about the movement and what was taking place, stating that they were in solidarity to the Black community and not necessarily putting action towards that statement. And as a Black female founder of, of a software solutions agency, it felt you know, very necessary for me to simply create a door, I'd like to believe, of an example of what it looks like to truly try to solve a problem, especially in technology. What we know in this particular industry, when we look at founders, startups, um, technology companies, is we still have a deep disparity of Black founders. We still have a deep disparity, even as we look at Black founders in technology, few of them actually own the proprietary technology in which they have started. So we still aren't seeing equity in Black tech. We're seeing um, presence. We're not seeing equity. And if we continue down this path, it is my opinion that we aren't going to solve this problem we all keep pointing out. So what 
this grant is hopefully going to allow us to do or has allowed us to do over the past two years, we've um, taken on I believe 15 startups, both nonprofit and for-profit, and we'll be seeing them. They've been launching throughout the year and we'll be seeing even more launch throughout the year. So you can stay connected with Copper and Vine Studio, go to our website, coppervinestudio.com, sign to our newsletter, and you always get to see our launches and you get to be our beta, you get to be a beta user for any of our startups. What that has already produced really? is- yeah, so you get to be oh, one of the fun. first users of okay. every startup. Everyone is a Black founded. Majority of them are Black women founded, which is even more exciting. They're some of my favorite clients. I just love their innovation. They're all really great at innovative ideas and really solving problems in communities. And um, under there's a lot under health that we're doing. Um, and we are going to continue to do it. So we're still taking applications for the RICO grant. And the requirement is you get to be a Black founder and you get to build something. So it's not meant for you to just start a company. It actually is meant to get products in market. Why this is so important is when we look at the economic disparity between founders, it is the difference between um, a founder being able to build and sell their technology versus a founder not. We hope that with this grant, we will be one of the examples of how to how to be a support to that. Um, and we hope that agencies will follow in our footsteps. That also, I mean, this is a total sidebar. Uh, one of my projects, because you talk about finding what nurtures our soul, is I'm trying to write an actual sci-fi book. Um, and one of the dilemmas that one of the characters runs into that informs what she does next is that dilemma of being the creator of something versus being owner of something and how that ownership was taken out of her hands. Uh, and it informed her next series of actions in a way that radicalized her in a very different direction as a character. And, and I call this out because the connection that you just described is also something that one of our previous guests talked about, and that was Tiffany Spencer, who is the founder of HBCU Force. She talks about there's a very big difference when you look at generational wealth and what ownership of your own destiny does to generational wealth. And, and Cheryl also in, in our previous discussion talked about generational wealth as well and the enormous disparity that exists there. So thank you for articulating a path towards creating that generational wealth and supporting it. That's amazing. Yeah, I, um, I'm really, you know, I've, I've been looking around at the market to figure out like, how do I get my proprietary work through Now it Matters on the market? and so like I perk up any time a fund hits and, you know, so I saw your announcement on LinkedIn immediately went there and uh, as an ally, I mean, as a business person, I wasn't as enthusiastic, but as an ally, I was excited to see one more place where I'm excluded. And I think that that is what we need to see, like white allies need to see more and more is fewer places where we can just stroll in and have our thing work. And so thank you for creating a, a place where that doesn't work for me. We want to see more of that. Um, I know that's not at all the intention, um, but I actually mark progress on that. When I, look at, when I look at what the world needs to look like, it actually needs to be places that, um, yeah, that I can't, that, I, that, that uh, exclude me. And so I'm really excited about that fund. I'm really, I love your work. Um, we will put the we will put copper and vine in the show notes, and then um, we we hope you have a flood of applicants. Um, in uh, and it seems like you're going to keep doing this year over year. Is that is that the intention? Oh yeah, buy grace isn't going anywhere. We actually have a projection that in the past next ten years, we're actually going to buy an island and build a restoration retreat for leaders all over the world. Sweet. Yep. That. That sounds enormous, and I have every confidence that that will happen. I can't wait to see it. Awesome. Thank you Rikia, all for having me. I will never stop being grateful for these moments to unpick the really hard stuff and, and finding both commonality, but also education in, in those discussions. And I know this is going to be one of those recordings that our listeners look back on and we're like, wow, I... I want to emulate this more. I want to be this more. So thank you. 
Thank you all. Thank you. one. I've always loved this company. I love one the ty- the name of the company, and I love what you all do, and how you do it so unapologetically. So thank you for just being not only an avenue but a resource in so many ways. And so Tim and Tracy, I just you know Tim, I'm, I'm always in honor of how much you poured into this community. And Tracy, I just your force is amazing. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. I'm Tim Lockie. I'm Tracy Kronzak, and you've been listening to Why It Matters. Why It Matters is a thought leadership project of Now It Matters, a strategic services firm offering advising and guiding to nonprofit and social impact organizations. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, check out our playlists, and visit us at nowitmatters.com to learn more about us.